Hello. All right. Please be seated, everyone. Uh, our uh, next speaker is Paul Smith. He's a deputy CDO of DNC, and he's a co-founder of EveryBlock. And he's going to talk about spatial data and uh, web mapping with Python. Uh, Can, can every, everyone hear me okay? Okay. Um, I used to work at a company called Every Block, and we made our own custom maps. We did not take a solution off the shelf. We took publicly, freely publicly available data about streets, about parks, water, and along with a brand new library called Mapnik uh, and some custom Python, and we made our own map tiles. And we did it so that we could have control, full control over the style, as well as do some interesting visualizations. And just this, that was in 2008. Um, and just this past week, uh, two major companies announced that they were, they were essentially doing the same thing. They were uh, rolling their own map solutions. And I think that it's instructive that <laughs> Back in 2008, we thought we were opening the floodgates for a slew of custom maps uh, to emerge. And it's been four years, and I think we're finally starting to see that like mainstream acceptance of doing it yourself. Uh, it, it, I also think that it's indicative of the fact that working with spatial data and making maps is kind of a curveball for a lot of developers. Um, so my talk today is about understanding the full picture of spatial data and getting comfortable with it as developers and, and, and what it looks like to work with it on a daily basis and make maps. So we're going to be heavy on concepts today. I'm also going to talk about Python libraries and applications you can use, uh, and I'll touch briefly on some data sources. But uh, conceptually, I think uh, there's a lot to cover. <laughs> And, and this is kind of a, don't let this list intimidate you. Uh, I'm going to go through it pretty quickly, but it should give you kind of a 30,000 foot view of uh, what it's like to work with spatial data. And these are sort of the big, big categories that you'll encounter time and again. So it's good to, ha to say like, okay, I know what that means. And when presented with a problem, you sort of be able to get your hand, head around it. Uh, so spatial data are data and collections of data with multiple dimensions, usually two, two dimensions or three dimensions and maybe sometimes four dimensions. You could think of two and three dimensions. That's pretty obvious. Fourth dimension might be to add time. Um, but uh, what that means are data that are coordinates that represent a point or points in space, um, either on a plane, like a, a geometric plane, or on a globe, like the Earth. And just as a little sidebar, I think um, one of the reasons that there is this conceptual hurdle to working with spatial data is that uh, for, we're, we're great at working with one-dimensional data. We're great at working with non-spatial data. Um, there's enormous amount of collective wisdom here and in, in the programmer community at large uh, with working with alphanumeric data, chars, ints, floats, uh, collections of that data, uh, strings. And I think it gets to the fact that Representationally, you've got this array of memory cells in a computer, and so you can have hello world encoded uh, very straightforwardly, and everybody understands how to work with that, and how to slice and dice it, and order it, and sort it. And it's because the machine, that's the, we're working at the level of the machine there. We're working with machine primitive operations and fast pointer operations. So when you think of spatial data, you can't really do the same sort of things that you can do with non-spatial or scalar data. Um, comparisons, well, not really. That's, that doesn't really make sense. Like, how would you compare a point and another point uh, like you would, like, a lowercase a and an uppercase a? That's pretty, pretty, pretty well understood how we compare those in, in programming, uh, but not in spatial data. Uh, ordering, not really. Ranges, kind of, sort of. So I think it's... Just as like a caveat, it's worth thinking of spatial data as more like objects, kind of opaque, 
rather than values that are represented with machine primitives. So with that aside, if we, if we talk about the, the sort of the root node of spatial data, we'll, we have geometry and we have geography. And geometry is the, the planar, the, your, 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 ge your geometry class uh, in grade school. It's Euclidean, it's, it's two-dimensional, it's three-dimensional X, Y, maybe X, Y, Z. So some, some uh, you know, a horizon and uh, a, a, you know, horizontal line, a vertical line, maybe a line coming out of the wall. And then geography, we're talking about this, the, a point on an ellipsoid. So the Earth is in a round sphere, it's bulges in the middle. We call that an ellipsoid. And a point on that ellipsoid is uh, defined as a, a point of latitude and longitude, or maybe in we include elevation in the third dimension. And um, the units of those two uh, types of spatial data are, in, in geometry, it's whatever that, the units of that plane are. So if we've got a four foot by six foot map on the wall, well, the XY point on, of some arbitrary point on the wall will be in inches or feet or whatever. And in geography, we talk about degrees, uh, either in degrees decimal or with degrees minutes and seconds. Um, and if we're in the third dimension, we include elevation, that could be feet or meters or what have you. Um, and just real quick, terminologically, features, you see this a lot in working with spatial data, features is just uh, a, a way of saying you've got some domain data, right? Like whatever you're uh, tracking in your application, and you've got, which has some collection of attribute data, maybe a name, an email, ID, and then one or more geometries. So that collection, that bundle, is called a feature. Um, so you could think of it as like a row in a database. And, uh, and just to, so we looked at the, the two types of spatial data, geometry and geography, but they're both geometries. So they're both, uh, they both talk about objects that are points, lines, polygons. We're, we're all familiar with that and then the multiple versions of that. So you can have a single geometry, which is a multi-point, or a multi-string, or a multi-polygon. Um, or, or you could have a, a collection of, of uh, geometries that's agnostic about the type. So it could be a collection of points and line strings. <laughs> and then another fundamental type is, uh, or not necessarily a fundamental type, but a common type that we work with often are bounds. It's also known as uh, the minimum bounding rectangle. Uh, sometimes referred to as a bounding box or an envelope. You'll see those words thrown around. And th these are fairly well standardized. There's a body that says, okay, these are the kinds of geometries that we're, we're, we're working with, we typically work with. And there's kind of a fourth one of the fundamental types, uh, just that I, th I throw out there because it's kind of important, a linear ring. And it's just a, ver it's just a kind of, it's a form of the li line string or line where the last point where the n minus one point is the identical to the zero point, or the first point. And that just defines a closed uh, line string. Uh, it's also known as a contour. And the reason I mentioned, the reason they're important is line string, or linear rings comprise polygons. So a polygon is a, an exterior, which is a, a linear ring, and maybe has uh, zero or more interior um, linear rings. There's also some other configurations, but that's, that's the general idea. And then representationally, we can have uh, Python objects that represent, so I talked a little bit about how we represent data in the machine with values, and representationally with spatial data, it can be anything, it could be an array, a list of points, coordinates, a tuple, a dict, where the key and is x and the value is the, x, is the value of that x uh, coordinate. Um, and then bounds can be, or a bounding box, is almost always a Four, in the case of two dimensions, a four tuple or a list of params. Uh, in some cases, it can be a five point polygon. Um, and a, a bounding box is just uh, min x, min y, and max x, max, max y. And so, in the case of the polygon, you'd have the one, two, three, four, five points. <laughs> and then, when you're, you're sort of work a day uh, functions dealing with spatial data, uh, one of the things you're doing is you're, you're performing operations on that data, and that produces new geometries. So you take 
one polygon and another polygon, and what's the intersection that produces a new polygon? Um, we also, so these are just some common operations, difference, union, uh, centroid, getting the center point of a polygon or a line string, uh, buffer, take a point and with some amount and create a buffer around it or a line string or a polygon, create a buffer around it. And uh, you might recognize that the terminology uh, looks a lot like dealing with sets and that's no accident, the set theoretic language applies to spatial data, we're talking about sets of points and how they intersect, how they are different, how they create unions. And uh, just some examples, you're probably familiar with this kind of thing, but if not, like, let's imagine we have polygon A, polygon B, and on the right is the output of that operation. So we have, a, we have an intersection, that, that green uh, diamond in the middle is the intersection of those two polygons. Here's what the difference would be, like the difference in points, and uh, in, in it's sort of, it's not, um, you can't swap the order. Uh, so polygon A, what is the difference with polygon B in terms of points? If you swapped it, you would have output that would be on the right-hand side, of, the green would be on the right-hand side in that case. So the order matters in terms of difference, like a minus operation or divide. Union, what is the union? What, what points are the union of these two polygons or two geometries? Uh, a centroid point uh, for this polygon and a buffer of that centroid. So a buffer of a point creates a circle. A uh, buffer of a line string would create kind of a, an ellipse or a buffer of a polygon would create some crazy looking polygon. And then we also have, we have operations, we have predicates and predicates answer questions about the relationships between two geometries, two or more geometries. We ask whether polygon A contains polygon B. We ask whether uh, line string C is within polygon D. We, we ask whether they intersect. We ask whether there's, they're disjoint. And again, the set language comes into play here. And then not only are we performing operations and predicates on the, these geometries, we're dealing with collections of them. And here we start to get a little more practical. So how do we deal with these collections efficiently? Well, there are two, two big families of indexes that are unique to spatial data. Um, the first one is the R-tree family. So this is good for all types, whether it's a point or a polygon of geometry. <clears throat> and then there's the quad tree, which is best with point, point data only. Um, and an R-tree, the, the, the core concept is it's a tree like a B tree, except that the bounds, it has a, each node has a bounding box, and that bounding box is the sum or the union of all of its subtrees bounding boxes. And then sort of the, uh, the way that it works is that you insert, you update that tree, and there's, there's, uh, each node is defined with a, a maximum capacity, and when that capacity is reached, it splits. And then the split is designed to minimize the overlap between the two new nodes in terms of their bounding box. So this algorithm is actually really hard to do uh, optimally. So there are a lot of heuristics to, to do it. And the, the difference in the algorithms for splitting is what generally defines the family of R tree variants. And so there's R tree original, uh, there's R star tree, there's some others. Um, and the, it's the split algorithm that really di differentiates them. And then the leaf nodes are your actual objects or your features. So the way you would deal with an R tree would be, uh, this is what it might look if you plotted an R tree um, <clears throat> on the top and then at the bottom a tree diagram. You can see that the bounding boxes uh, overlap. You, the way you would query it is that you say, you have a probe and you say, is, is my probe in the bounding box of this, uh, this, this other bounding box? If yes, then recursively descend and ask the same question. If no, move on to the next uh, uh, object in the, in the node. Um, you'll notice that, like for example, in the case of one and two, their bounding boxes overlap, so you might have to search more than one subtree, um, and, there's some, and that's the reason why optimally splitting nodes uh, is so important, because you minimize the chance that you would have to, okay, I, 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 sub, I descended down one subtree, 
I didn't find anything. I got to go all the way back up and do another one. Uh, real quick, a quad tree is, uh, like I said, best with point data. And what happens is it divides up a space into quadrants recursively. And uh, just as a side note, if people are familiar with the geo hash, it's actually conceptually equivalent to that. So I encourage you to look that up on your own. It's a way of reducing the dimensionality of like a latitude and longitude into a one-dimensional string. And uh, it's also, which is the same concept as a space filling curve. So that's just something to, to think about if you're interested in exploring it further. But this is what a quad tree looks like. Uh, again, dividing up a space recursively by quadrants. And so your probe would be, is my point within this, in this quadrant, yes or no? And then uh, you, you drill down until you find the subquadrant that you're, the, the thing you're looking for is in. And then index queries are, generally fall into these three categories. You're asking, uh, given a point, and this is the case of the nearest neighbor, what are the K or the 50 points closest to it, or features closest to it? Uh, given a bounding box, give me back all the features that are within it. Uh, and if I have a point query, there may be some feature that's directly at that point. So almost all of your index, your day-to-day -day index queries are gonna fall into these three categories. Um, projections. So a projection is how we go from the, the, the ellipsoid or spheroid Earth to a flat surface. And it's, it's, uh, you can think of it as if you were peel, uh, peeling an orange and you had that, the skin of the orange peeled off, how would you flatten it off, flatten it onto the surface? That's one way of thinking about it. You would know that it doesn't quite... Uh, that you can't quite get a perfect uh, rectangle. You've got to make some trade-offs. So there's different trade-offs with different kinds of projections. I could give a whole talk on projections alone. Um, I'm just going to gloss over them really quickly. But that's how we go from a, uh, basically the big, big ge uh, ge ge geometric types to geographic types and vice versa. And spatial reference systems are basically ways that we hang labels on to certain projections. So projections are best big parameterized lists of trigonometric operations, and a spatial reference system is a convenient way of referring to one of those. So we've got some common ones. When you're dealing with latitude and longitude, you're almost all, it's a, you kind of has like a default projection, which is WGS84, and that is uh, a, what I call a fake projection, because it actually doesn't define how you project from latitude and longitude on a, on a sphere to a flat surface, but it's sort of a null operation uh, that makes it easy to store and work with data. So you'll often see that reference when you're dealing with just pure latitude and longitude. <laughs> uh, spherical Mercator, uh, so if people are familiar with Google Maps, this is the projection that Google Maps is in. It's often called uh, Google Mercator. Uh, uh, and a lot of other web maps have adopted it, Bing and Yahoo and OpenStreetMap and others. And uh, then there are, uh, so I'm just talking about, this is obviously not an exhaustive list, I'm just referring to a few common ones that you might see. Texas-centric Albers equal area, this is a particular favorite of mine. This uh, produces that classic shield shape of the US, continental US, and uh, you'll know what I'm talking about here in a second. And there are various state plane uh, projections that are great if you're dealing with and you need highly accurate data about a particular U.S. state. Um, I'm sorry, also this talk is fairly U.S. centric, but uh, um, so conceptually a lot of these things apply to the whole world. So this is, WG, this is what a map like, might look like in WGS84 in the fake projection. You can see the U.S. is kind of squat. Uh, this is what it looks, would look like maybe in Google Maps under the spherical mercator. And then here's Albers equal area uh, map. Again, here's the shield shape of the US. So there are different, what I'm glossing over here is there are different trade-offs with working with different projections. This, this projection I'm showing here, it wouldn't make sense for the whole world. Spherical Mercator, the reason it was picked was it's one that works at the highest zoom level to the lowest and all over the world. And that's why it was picked. So there, there are trade-offs based on what the scope of your spatial data are. Uh, real quickly, formats. They're, almost all of what I'm talking about here is vector data, so uh, points and lines and, and vectors. <laughs> and that's 
typically stored in, there's a few common formats. There's the shape file, that's the, sort of the granddaddy of them all. It's actually not a file at all, it's four files, um, <clears throat> or sometimes three. There's a misspelling there, that should be PRJ, which would define a projection, <clears throat> which is sometimes optional. Uh, the, uh, the data about the geometric shapes are, is in the shape, uh, it's basically a pointer in the shape file, the SHX is where the points actually live, and then the DBF would be where your attribute data is. GeoJSON is an extension of the JSON format that um, basically brings it into the world of features, so you have attribute data and you have geometric data. Uh, KML was, is, I think, familiar to a lot of people who work with Google Maps. It's a dialect or a, a version of, of XML. Real quick, WKT stands for well-known text, and it's a simple, human-readable um, serialization of points, lines, and polygons that you'll often see when you're working um, with this data. And real quick, raster. So not only are we talking about vector data, we're also talking about maps that already exist that are already in a particular projection. And that's what, where you would find something like a geotiff, uh, which would, let's say, you know, you've got satellite data or some flyover plane that's taking orthographic photos, that, that those photos are gonna have embedded in it the, the data about uh, where that photo was taken. So, oops. Um, uh, so that would be where you often see that in, uh, in, in the format called GeoTIFF. Sorry about that. All right. Okay, so we talked, that was the big conceptual piece that's out of the way. We can move on to some more practical, fun stuff. Uh, and then when we, when we talk about libraries, really we're talking about, and I'm assuming kind of a Unixy platform here, we're talking about core dependencies that are almost always written in C or Java, uh, maybe, but mostly C. Uh, and then the Python libraries that you would use kind of on top of that to make your life uh, a lot easier and you can work in pure, in pure Python. And those common libraries are uh, Google uh, OGR, which is part of the Google family. Um, this is for, these, this provides fu uh, functions for opening vector data, some of those formats I talked about earlier, doing transforms in uh, between projections. Uh, GEOS is uh, a, a library that handles some of those operations of predicates I showed you earlier, intersection, uh, some, uh, you know, is this point within another that's often handled by GEOS. Um, PROJ4 is where these spatial reference systems are defined. And libspatialindex is a pretty common um, C library for working with R tree data, or R tree indexes. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but here are some very common Python libraries that uh, you'll encounter working with spatial data and maps. Uh, Shapely, Rtree, Mapnik, GeoDjango, and Cartograph. Shapely is a nice uh, wrapper around GEOS, the, that, that library that provides you uh, operations and predicates for manipulating uh, geometries. So you could easily create a point using common Python syntax. You could create a buffer around that point, that's the amount of the buffer, and get the area of that point, or that new polygon uh, that's created from the buffer. Uh, and then there's the WKT, the serialization that I mentioned earlier. And just, you might, people might notice that the area of that buffered point is not 314.159, it's not exactly pi, and that's because when you buffer a point, it doesn't actually create a pure circle, it creates an approximation of a circle with a certain number of line segments. So it's almost like a octagon or something with more dimensions, or not more dimensions, but more points than that. So um, it's an approximation. Uh, and here's an example of working with R-Tree. The R-Tree uh, Python library wraps libspatialindex. And let's say that we have a collection of states, state features. They have a, a, an, like a primary key, some attribute data, and a, and a geometry. That geometry could be a shapely geometry. We create our index, we iterate over our features, and we insert into that index the, that primary key and the bounding box of our feature, our feature's geometry. And then we, let's, ha let's say we have a probe. We want to find out which state is that point in. So we create our point, and then uh, 
index.intersection is that essentially bounding box query. It's, a, it's an iterator, so we uh, call list around it. And the, the, the method call is dot intersection and then a bounding box. So since we have a point, we can sort of fake a bounding box by repeating the, the x and the y. Uh, and then that returns two objects. And the reason it returns two objects is remember, it's only indexed our bounding box. So even though that point is only in one, uh, is only in, in the world one polygon, it's in two different bounding boxes. Uh, if you think about the bounding box of a state, especially some smaller uh, East Coast states, their, their bounding boxes could easily overlap quite a bit. So, we, so at this point, we then, uh, I, I don't show it here, but then what you would do is, oh, I do show it here. Yes. Um, at that point, we have a, a list of IDs. Then we would iterate over them, right? And then for each of the, so that would be the, those, the, the two that we found doing the bounding box query. For each of those, so we've narrowed it down to two. For each of those, then do the expensive query of is this point contained by our geometry? And if we found it, break out of that, and we found that this point is in Maryland. So conceptually, uh, we've, you've winnowed down the search space quite a bit by, um, by using a bounding box search, and then you can iterate over a much smaller set. So for example, if you were working with, say, there's over 250,000 voting precincts in the US, and you wanted to find out, where do I go to vote? And I know my latitude and longitude. Well, it, that's a big O-N, 250,000 uh, number of objects that you would have to search through and ask, is this point within? Using, this, using an archery query, you can winnow that down to just a, a handful of objects so your, your big O number becomes much smaller, uh, and you can get an answer uh, real quick. OK, Mapnik. So Mapnik, like I mentioned, is a library for creating maps. And just terminologically, what we're talking about are uh, creating basically raster images uh, of base maps, map tiles. You might hear that word throwing around. Um, it's written in C++. It has Python and Node.js bindings. And it has plugins for reading from spatial databases uh, in common vector formats. And so typically what you would do if you're working in a map context on the web, you would create uh, individual map tiles that were, say, 256 by 256 pixels uh, in size. And each one of those is rendered individually. The, what happens is your browser has some JavaScript that knows the extent of your viewport. And it translates that into some real-world latitude and longitude, makes a request to your server, and then it knows to say, OK, I need the tile for this uh, bounding box, this bounding box, this bounding box. And the, so those are each individual HTTP requests. And then your browser does the work of reassembling that, each of those individual image requests back together in your browser. So that's what happens when you use Google Maps or comparable um, product. And uh, Mapnik is pretty flexible. You, people have done some really interesting work with it. Uh, created an 8-bit version of the city of New York. Uh, so there's a lot you can do with it. Um, and just here's some, some code to create a quick map in Mapnik. You would import Mapnik. Uh, you create a map object. And uh, it has a certain, certain height and width. You create, essentially, styles and layers. And those styles match up with layers. So in our case, we would create a polygon uh, style that has a certain color, a line that has a certain color, append that to our map as a style. And then let's say we're creating a, a map of states. We would query our spatial database. Uh, we would then say that for this layer, this certain style applies. And then append that layer to our map. And then we use a, an envelope or a bounding box to set the extent of our map. So we zoom to that box. We, output, we, we get an image object, we render it into it, and then we can return that as a byte string that you could serve directly to a, a client or save to a file. Uh, GeoDjango is a fantastic library that's bundled with the Django web framework. It basically spatially enables the ORM in Django, and it has nice standalone uh, wrappers for GIOS, Google, OGR, 
GOIP that, that are written in C types nice and clean. Uh, in fact, you can even import from those wrappers without importing all of the Django machinery. So if you just need to work with spatial data, um, I, I recommend that shapely. Either of them can work with these uh, uh, data types and file formats um, really well. Uh, so here's an example of a spatially enabled model in GeoDjango. It's, it, it's a feature, essentially. We've got some attribute data about it. And then uh, we've got a geom, uh, which is a, a multi-polygon, because states have multiple polygons. Uh, if you think about islands or, or the state of Michigan has two polygons, the Upper Peninsula. Um, and then we essentially make it spatially enabled by creating a, a, a different kind of manager for it objects equals models.geomanager. So let's say we had a different model that was congressional districts, and we wanted to know which of my Django objects uh, that are congressional districts, which of their geometries contain some point I'm interested in. So you can see that it um, <coughs> sort of enhances the, the ORM's existing query syntax to make that really an easy operation. And this is a library that I just found out uh, about this week that I think is pretty new. It's only been uh, worked on for a couple of months. It's called Cartograph. And um, it's a library and a command line interface that essentially takes as input shape files and a, a little bit of configuration and outputs an SVG file. Um, and this is really interesting because when you're working with spatial data and trying to put it on the web, there's kind of a dance that you need to do about what's your base map and what's your feature overlay data. Uh, and this kind of bakes it, so it would be really cool for like news applications and, and other sort of like one-off applications where you're, you, know, you need to create like a nice looking base map and, and some other kind of data visualization on top of it in SVG, which is a very efficient format. You can style it with CSS. You can add behavior with JavaScript, like the D3 library or what have you. So it's really exciting. Um, it cre the, the developer of it has created some beautiful maps uh, in a showcase. Um, so I, I was just sort of blown away by it, and I thought I'd include it. Uh, here's the configuration that you would include. It's just some JSON to make I just did this in like five minutes. This, is, this configuration creates this map pretty easy. Um, and that's an SVG file you can load in your browser and include in another web page. OK, real quick. So there's a couple of applications that you might be interested in. Tile stash. So I talked earlier about the, the map NIC and how it renders individual tiles that are sent to the browser by separate HTTP requests. Tile stash is the thing that kind of handles that. IPython, new version of IPython has inline, um, has a, 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 a graphical console and inline plotting that you can marry with uh, spatial data in, to create interactive console visualizations. QGIS is an exciting desktop application I'll talk about in one second. <laughs> okay, tile stash. Uh, this is a tile server. It serves rendered map, MapNIC tiles, so you can import MapNIC and, and point browsers directly at it. You can serve pre-rendered tiles, vector data, and will also cache out to S3 or whatever uh, cache backend you want to make subsequent loads that much more efficient. It's just a, wet, a whiskey application, so it's really easy to get to work with. Um, IPython, late, new versions, like I mentioned, have a QT console, so if you're working with Shapely, Check out a library called Descartes from PyPy, and you can get inline uh, plots using the matplotlib syntax of your geometric object. So this is really exciting. This is how you invoke it, and then you can just do pretty straightforward commands to, uh, these are the intersection graphs that I showed you earlier. I just did that with the, Q, the IPython Qt console. Uh, QGIS. This is a desktop application. It's cross-platform. It rivals ArcGIS and MapInfo in terms of functionality. It's open source, GPL, and you can uh, add layers to it from your shape files, from spatial databases. You can do all sorts of visualizations uh, and spatial analysis. And it works with Python. You can write plugins to extend it uh, that can do whatever you want um, from 
uh, statistical analysis to nearest neighbor, what, whatever kind of uh, extension you need, you can write Python for. Uh, real quick, some data sources that you might want to uh, examine to get to work with. And again, US-centric caveat here. Uh, the US Census provides freely available data from something called Tiger Line. Uh, this is streets, congressional districts, county boundaries, states. Um, just a, an enormous, invaluable wealth of freely available da data. Uh, National Atlas, if you need like shorelines and water features, that's a great resource. Open Street Map is when I showed you earlier, Foursquare and Apple are converting to uh, these, dif these different maps. Most of those maps are built using OpenStreetMap, which is a collaboratively edited streets database, which is kind of an amazing thing. And uh, you can often find data from your state and local GIS departments. Um, they're, you know, they're paid by our tax dollars. They have great data. They're often willing to share it, so I would check that out. Um, I left out a lot in this talk. There's so much to talk about when it comes to uh, this topic, including spatial databases I didn't get into. Uh, PostGIS, which I think is the, the, the best out there. It spatially enables PostGRE database. Um, also working in your browser with JavaScript, that's where a lot of the action happens. Uh, the, these, these are some of the libraries you might use. And then you, things have gotten a lot better on the map design front, working interactively with design and maps. And this is not a Python application, but I thought I'd mention it anyway, Tile Mill. Um, great, great, great application for, for seeing the designs of your maps before you render them. So real quick, I wanted to issue a challenge um, to you all with, based on some of the information I gave you today, I'd like you to ask, like, who is my congressman? Can I write an app to find out who my congressman is? And you could do this with, by downloading congressional districts and states, shape files from Tiger Line, US Census, the Sunlight Foundation has an API to get the names of those representatives that are in those congressional districts, and then uh, use a Google Maps geocoder or your HTML5 geolocation in browser to get a, a point of where you're at. Um, so just to give you a hint of how you might do this, I would build an R tree index. I would query for all congressional districts where that point that we found from geocoding is within, and then loop over the result set to find the one and only one congressional district that that point is in, and then return the name of the congressman. Um, and with that, I'm pretty much wrapped up and ready to take some questions. Everybody's already a GIS expert, so there's no questions. Good. Uh, what would be a good general purpose tool for someone who doesn't know what they're doing? And, um, but in particular, um, when I've approached it before, I've been able to get hold of some shape files, but I can't translate them from one to the next and uh, translating shape files seems to be a black art. Uh, the question, so the question is, how do we translate between different formats? Uh, I would check out something called uh, the Goodle. So GDAL, I talked about a little bit earlier. There's a, a collection of Unix binaries that, uh, like OGR to OGR, OGR info, that is basically like a Swiss Army knife for converting between formats, doing projections, um, there's just a lot you can do. You could say, like, I've got this huge data set, some huge shape file. I only care about some small bit of it, so, so extract that part for me. Uh, so I would check that out. Hey, maybe you could speak to the differences between uh, R trees and uh, quad trees, you know, in terms of like range queries and point queries and so forth. It seemed like you kind of glossed over that. Uh, sure. So. An R tree, if your data set, if you know that your data set is going to contain not just points, but also lines, polygons, maybe multiple versions of those, then really R tree is the only way to go because it, it works by the bounding box. Um, if, if, you're, if you know that your data set is all points, it's always, always going to be all points, then a quad tree is a fine substitute. 
Uh, in terms of performance, I, it, it, the quad tree is probably going to beat it if it's pure point data on both sides. Um, but uh, in terms of trade-offs, it really comes down to which, what are your ge geometry types of your, of your application. Um, hi. So I've got a little experience trying to develop um, mobile dashboards that are map-based. And the initial approach was to send all the data to the client. Um, so you very quickly end up with you know, megs of data on the client in JSON or whatever, GeoJSON, and trying to do it in a web map. So do you have any best practices or any, know of any libraries that help you um, optimize how much data you're going to send from server to client, depending on the kind of, does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Um, it's a really hard problem. So there are a couple of things you could do. One is oftentimes the serialized representation of the GeoJSON objects, the geometries, has way more precision than you need for your application. So often, if you look at the source of it, you might see a decimal point and then like 10 or 12 uh, places after that. And you don't need all of that. Like three decimal places is, is I think, like you know, six, six meters of accuracy or something like that. So you could post-process the data before it's sent to the client to strip that out. Uh, and that'll reduce the file size. Now, if you're using gzip, you might not get that much of a, a difference um, if you're using gzip encoding. Uh, at your web server level. Um, other ways to do it might be to, this is kind of tricky, but can you paginate the results in a way? Like, can you start with a smaller bounding box that may be smaller than the actual viewport and return that set and then expand the viewport out, successively send back several responses to the client that load uh, without blocking? Um, that's one way to do it. But uh, another problem you're going to have is the more objects that you have in the client, then you're going to get poor performance because it's tracking all these vertices. So another suggestion I would have would be to look at simplification. So simplification takes a geometric object and removes points that maybe not be necessary for display, but keeps the topographic shape the same. Is that so, library yeah, there are libraries that do that. Um, uh, I'm drawing a blank at the moment, but uh, it's actually built into PostGIS. You can say uh, simplify my geometry by some tolerance, and it will literally remove vertices, greatly reduce the file size, um, and especially if you're talking about a, a small scale map where you're, way, you're zoomed way out, you don't need all that resolution, so that's something I would look at too. Uh, you mentioned that quad trees aren't, are only good for point data, which I found a little disappointing because now it makes me feel like I've been wasting my time on something. Um, Using quad trees, it's possible to define, you know, if you say A, B, C, D as your four quadrants, you're able to define bounding boxes at arbit arbitrary um, sizes so that you can do a linear search using, for instance, regex in order to just look at the very beginning and determine whether or not something falls within that bounding box. Um, I know it's not strictly a quad tree, but am I going down the wrong path? Hopelessly, I mean, I'm missing something here. Well, wh I mean, what kind of data are you trying to index? Is it point? Is it point data? No, polygon. Uh, anything, polygon, anything. Uh, multi-part, anything. I mean, you. The the essential thing that you're doing with the quad tree is you're trying to reduce the number of dimensions that you're uh, querying against, right? So, I think what you're talking about can be made to happen with a lot of work. I would look at an R tree as a substitute um, instead of trying to jump through all these hoops to sort of fit your mental model of the data you're working at into the quad tree. Um, there, I, I know there's been a lot of research in how we, uh, especially on like distributed systems, like these indexes only really work and make sense if you're talking about one node. And what, what would it be to like index data across multiple nodes. And so a lot of people are looking at dimension, dimensionality reduction, quad trees, geohash, that sort of thing. Um, so there may be research out there that kind of gets to what you're talking about. But if, if you can get away with it, I would say just use an R tree. Sure. I get the real reason would be that now you get into a parallel map reduce uh, index search so that you can split up and index across you know, many things. And besides, it's fun to reinvent the wheel. Right. Hi, I was I had this map app in mind, and I was wondering if there was a, a JavaScript. Oh, 
So I have this map app in mind, and I was wondering if there's this jo uh, JavaScript library that does what I'm thinking of. So like, say you're, you're panning around, and you want polygons to load dynamically kind of behind the scenes in an intelligent manner, caching in JavaScript and only grabbing the, de the deltas you need through, say, like Ajax. Um, is there any kind of like JavaScript library that makes that sort of thing easy? I, I'm not sure. I would look at open layers because it has such a rich feature set of uh, functionality, but uh, without knowing more about your application. So, well, I was, I was have just. You, have you looked at what, what have you looked at so far? I haven't, I haven't looked at anything. I was just okay. thinking about this, and it, it sounds definitely doable, but I was like, oh, there's definitely some tricky things in there, and I was um, thinking there's probably someone's already done this uh, right. to some extent. I don't know. I mean, maybe we could talk after about okay. some options. All right. Uh, as a quick and dirty, I, I've got uh, various shapes that are in raster form. What would be the best tool to be able to overlay it onto something and, and and or uh, apart from that, create shapes from scratch where you really got to draw them in. So uh, you're saying I, I've got some rasters and I want to get vector data from it? Uh, yeah. Or in a related? Yeah, in other words, I've, I've, I've either got them in paper form or I've got yeah. them in some sure. non-usable form. Some, you know, I can look at them, but that's all I can do with them. <laughs> yeah, like sort of broadly, this topic is called like geo-registering. So the idea is that you would take if you have a known coordinate space and then you have your map, whatever it is, like a scanned object or something, all you need to do is define three points on it and it will wrap that, uh, it'll make that raster fit the underlying coordinate system. And there's something called Goodle Wrap, G-D-A-L-W-R-A-P, that does this automatically. So Is that uh, an open source tool? Yeah, it's open source. It's part of the Goodle family. of or part of Google, Google Wrap? G Goodle, G-D-A-L. Find the uh, name here. The first one. Hi. Um, how do the uh, data structures behave when you want to query uh, a polygon that goes, you know, the line on the Kiribati Islands where the plus 180 and minus 980 are the same line? So the, the fact that the Earth is a sphere, sphere and not a rectangle. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't follow. Can you uh, I mean, repeat uh, that? I'm sorry. The, the longitude plus 180 and minus 980. Oh, you're talking about the, the date line? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, there, I, basically, the, the long and the short of it is that we define longitude to be mi between minus 180 degrees and plus 180 degrees. So if you have ge geometric objects that span that, and this is the international date line in the middle of the Pacific, uh, you're mathematical calculations or whatever can blow up. But most applications these days you can configure to recognize, say, basically like international dateline equals true. Um, so a lot of libraries ha will expose that as a, essentially a workaround. All right, thanks. Yep. All right. Thanks, everyone.